welcome to the Earthworks Podcast, where our team will share the jargon of carbon from many of our turf friends from the past 30 years. Thank you for joining us, Ross. I know it's been a little difficult trying to uh, wrangle this in. We've had some technical difficulties and some scheduling issues, but thank you for coming on with us. We really appreciate it. No worries. No worries. My pleasure, Chad. Uh, so for those of you who may not know, Ross Miller is certified golf course superintendent at Country Club of Detroit. Um, and he was kind enough to want to sit down or maybe not want to sit down, just didn't want to say no. Uh, but Ross has been a really good friend to Earthworks and, and an excellent supporter. Uh, he does a fantastic job out there. So, Ross, how about just a little backstory to get started? What got you into this business? Um, where are you from? How did this all come come about? Uh, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chad. Um, so my background, I'm from a, a very small community in Northwest Ohio, uh, 400 people, uh, no stoplights uh, at all. Public school, my graduating class was the largest ever through the school, and we had 42 people. Uh, so very, very small community, a very tight knit community. Um, so my mother's side of the family had a, a large apiary farm where we had beehives all over uh, Western Ohio. So grew up with uh, agriculture, a little bit different form of agriculture than many in beekeeping. Uh, and then my father's side of the family, his, uh, his parents were, um, excuse me, one of the initial investors in a small uh, mom and pop uh, at that time, nine hole course. Uh, called Delphus Country Club, uh, which has since gone to 18 holes, uh, which I grew up, started working on at age 13 uh, for the superintendent that is still there to this day, Mike Fast. Um, it was his first year as a superintendent as well, and started there uh, doing tea service, uh, raking bunkers, and enjoyed the hours, enjoyed the, the difference in variation in work, and Ended up enrolling at Penn State, uh, uh, bachelor program there, graduated in 04. Um, uh, did, I was very, very fortunate. I interned at Double Eagle Club in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, spent a couple of years there with Todd Voss, who I consider one of my two mentors. Uh, was very fortunate there and learned a great deal uh, with him and at that property. Um, and then from there, once I graduated, uh, came back to Ohio for a year at Sylvania Country Club, uh, and then moved back out uh, towards the East Coast and spent uh, 10 years in the Washington, D.C. metro area. Uh, first at what was called Lowe's Island Club at that time, that then uh, rolled into uh, the Trump Organization, purchased the property, and uh, worked for the Trump Organization for what is now Trump National D.C. and for what I consider my other mentor, uh, Brad Eaney. Um, and in 2014, uh, had the great opportunity to come back towards the Midwest and come here to CCD and been here ever since and happy as a clam. Sure. Sure. And I mean, I'm not, yeah, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with the club, at least. I mean, it's very impressive. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about country club of Detroit and some of its history? Yeah. Yeah. Very, um, uh, in country club of Detroit, the membership here is a very, very proud membership a very, um, I guess what you would say is uh, um, uh, an old world club. It is still invitation only to become a member here. Uh, membership is full, but it's a, it's a unique property in that one, uh, like you got to see a few weeks ago, uh, we have a six lane bowling alley. Our clubhouse is massive, 18 hole property in our, we have an 80,000 square foot clubhouse. Uh, we have just over a thousand total members. Um, it is a very, very, very busy 18 hole property. Uh, we're very fortunate. Um, a lot of generational members. Uh, for example, our board president last year was third generation board president. So very uh, steeped in tradition, uh, hosted two U.S. amateurs, uh, one of which uh, was the springboard for Arnold Palmer's career. Uh, he won the 1954 U.S. amateur here. Um, and then, uh, we were fortunate last year, we hosted the U S senior amateur. Um, and, um, uh, so that was, a, another great foray back into championship golf, uh, and amateur golf routes. The club has been very, very adamant. They are very big supporters of amateur golf. So the original, 
Uh, the course has had two iterations. We've actually had four clubhouses. Uh, the club used to be right on Lake St. Clair, which is now about 300 yards from our front front gates. Uh, but uh, the club sold off sections of the property to the property where it is now, uh, what we call the, the hill. Um, uh, the original course was a Burtway design. That went away. Uh, then uh, uh, Harry Colt came in, designed the, redesigned the course. And his partner came back in after the 19, 1915 U.S. Amateur that we hosted, uh, redesigned the course again on its present routing. And it's had several iterations through the years from Robert Trenjun Sr. to um, uh, Art Hills, Jeff Mungin, uh, a number, uh, Keith Foster, and who we have really um um, aligned with well with Renaissance Design and Brian Slonick, uh, their lead design associate that we, we work with heavily to this day. Very good. And you have some future work coming up as well, uh, practice facility area? Knock on wood, hopefully. We're, on wood. We're, in the, we're in the process, long range planning right now. We're looking to um, uh, work through some planning items with a, a large membership committee and then roll it out to the membership as a whole. Uh, in which we are looking to, we have a nine hole short course, uh, two par fours and seven par threes and a driving range, uh, a large chunk of acreage, but we're looking to uh, um, reimagine, redesign all of this, not only for um, an opti optimization for member use aspect, but more so um, as well for uh, operational needs, uh, infrastructure needs to really provide the optimal product for our membership. So knock on wood, hopefully. Um, uh, Brian Slonick's had some great, great ideas. We're having some great conversations at the membership level. So we're, we're looking forward to a, a great, uh, hopefully, um, something that the membership can all agree on and then we can move forward from there. Sure. A uh, couple of things to kind of go back to. So you had mentioned the USGA tournament and and you want to share a little bit maybe about the COVID difficulties and having to reschedule, but was this also, you know, your goal and the club's goal to bring in more amateur tournaments from there? Do you think that was a springboard of sorts or an initiation of sorts to, to maybe be involved in getting a junior am or a mid am or things like that? Uh, it's a good question. Um, uh, the, the COVID challenges were uh, a challenge. So we were originally slated, uh, as you well know, to host in 2020. Uh, obviously, um, COVID-19 pandemic threw a massive monkey wrench in that. The, the championship was canceled. Uh, we were then in negotiations with the USGA to move back to 2024. Um, unfortunately, the honors course down in Tennessee that was slated to host in 21, they had uh, some very, very unfortunate um, uh, tornadoes roll through the property and they were going to have some challenges, uh, being, uh, championship ready. Um, and it, uh, the USGA, uh, broached, uh, the subject with us. Would we like to possibly move up to 21? Um, when we, we graciously accepted, we said, absolutely. Um, cause also it, it, if uh, that short course and driving range project comes to fruition, hopefully that slates in timeline where 2024, we would have been under the knife anyhow. Sure. Uh, so um, all, all parties concerned, it worked. Um, the challenges with hosting the championship through, through all of that, uh, the layers of leverage we had to be ready to pull as far as um, safety aspects, um, legal aspects, um, and working with the USGA was, uh, very, very beneficial, very, um, very open. Everyone communicated very well. Um, uh, we were looking to help them out as much as possible. And they, they wanted to have an exceptional championship for the players and, and for the membership as a whole. Um, but, uh, getting back to your question in regards to, uh, oh, getting back into championship amateur golf. I'm not real sure. Um, the, the board initiative at that time, that, that was, that was a big push, mm -hmm. uh, cause the club saw that as a big opportunity. Um, at this time, uh, we don't know. The club is very, we're very focused from a board level, from an operational level, membership level of, um, continuing to, um, 
uh, for lack of a better term, sharpen the knife of what we offer our members to the highest level. Um, and, and then strategically and long range planning, looking at continuing to uh, improve some of the amenities we have, hence our short course, our driving range. So we're, we're mainly focused on that right now, but I, I can see that being a possibility down the road for sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I didn't know about the beekeeping or if you had told me that I had forgotten, do you incorporate that at the club as well? Uh, you know, I know a lot of golf course superintendents have, have kind of started to, to bring in beekeeping. Is that something you guys do over there? Yes, actually, uh, we've taken last year and this year off uh, of it. Uh, it's actually stemmed uh, right before I started. Our executive chef uh, has been pushing, pushing okay. for it. Um, and we're looking at, um, it's funny you bring that up, because actually just on Monday, uh, our, our executive chef, Brian Bielan, and I were going through um, how we want to build things out moving forward, because we're looking to do that. Uh, in conjunction with also um, uh, maple syrup uh, collection on the property, doing uh, doing those things to create some uh, cohesive, collaborative operational items that also continue to drive membership uh, enjoyment with the property. You know, sure. theme dinners with uh, honey. Uh, that's what he did. We we're obviously I mentioned Brian, our executive chef. He's yeah, we're very, very fortunate. He is world-class chef and our head pastry chef, uh, Amy Knowles, uh, is able to really uh, let her talents blossom with uh, things like this, a honey themed dinner, a maple syrup themed dinner, yeah. uh, where they can really create some really cool, unique uh, things and layer in uh, with our sommeliers here with uh, wine pairings and um, bourbon pairings, things like that. Mm -hmm. So some pretty cool different offerings, but we're on hold right now uh, just because uh, obviously all of the um, labor challenges, supply chain challenges that everyone's facing, we're, we're, we're focusing more on getting those things squared away. And then when some things stabilize, we're going to layer that back in. Okay. And you've told me before, I mean, to your point that your membership is very proud of, of the clubhouse and of, you know, of, of the culinary team there. Uh, and make great use of it. And I think you'd, you'd told me before the numbers that you might get for Christmas and Thanksgiving or things of that nature. Yeah, it's, it's a very, um, especially uh, far Northern club, Southeastern Michigan, most of the time, you know, December, January, February, very sleepy times um, at the clubs. Uh, we are a 364 a day, 364 days a year operation. Um, it is rocking and rolling. And one of our busiest month here is the month of December. So between member, uh, like, uh, businesses, their Christmas parties that they host either, um, uh, in dinner at the clubhouse or the big thing is the, the bowling alley. Sure. Um, using that for member parties is, is huge. It's a great amenity for members to be able to share with their employees and their teams. So that, um, you bring up Christmas Eve dinner, like it's, it's 850 people for Christmas Eve dinner here. <laughs> it's, it's a monster. Um, and we're, um, the, the revenue level that we put out on that month is massive. Um, and it's obviously it's food and beverage driven. So it's, sure. it's a lot of hard work in the clubhouse in regards to that. And then our part that we contribute to it is, uh, Christmas decorations. Our longtime horticulturist Cassandra is in charge of that. You would think, oh yeah, you throw a couple fake trees up and some garlands, call it good. It's it's a massive process. So we start prepping in October, uh, preparing everything, uh, and then it takes uh, six of our staff members uh, an entire week, uh, forty hours, every single person to prep everything out and have everything set up. We have. Uh, three live trees, one of which in the uh, Great Hall is a 25 foot live tree. So um, that takes two team members alone uh, an entire day to to prepare. So it's Christmas is a big deal here. Uh, the holiday season is a very big deal, and we we treat it as such. Sure, sure. Um, you had already kind of mentioned who maybe you consider your mentors in, in the business. And I think we would all agree, those of us who are in this, this industry, that's a, 
that's a major player in who we become, how we become it, and things of that nature. But you yourself, I will compliment, do a wonderful job of that with your team. You've, you've had some great success the last couple of years with people moving on. Uh, care to share some of your unique scheduling that you've gone to and, and why that's important to you to, to kind of teach and, and blossom some, some assistant superintendents into their own roles? Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, Todd and Brad. Uh, Brad and I graduated two years apart at Penn State. Um, so when he came on board at Trump, D.C., uh, it was it was great because, you know, we had the youthful uh, enthusiasm that, hey, we want to really make this place shine and peel the layers of the onion back and get after it. Um, we had shared shared a very similar mindset and um, aligned on everything operationally very, very well. So that was that was great. And especially we, we had the good fortune in the, the economic times of 2010. And we, we, we threw north of $7 million down on renovations at that time frame. So that was, I, I will never take that for granted ever. Uh, it was a great experience uh, with two courses, renovating two courses back to back. Irrigation system, new irrigation system, uh, a, a great deal of moving parts. Um, and then uh, going back before that was Todd Voss at Double Eagle, who when I was there was director of grounds. He is now uh, chief operating officer of the club. Very different uh, from uh, both single owners from Trump DC uh, and Double Eagle, are both single owner setups. Trump DC is uh, politely put, it's a factory. It's a for-profit club uh, with very high expectations. So there's a lot to handle there and learn from. Uh, efficiency and scheduling is huge. Uh, Todd's operation at Double Eagle, uh, they're lucky if they hit 8,000 rounds a year. A uh, busy day was 40 golfers. So, but the, the conditioning was everything. Uh, still to this day, uh, like I was out there uh, for a board retreat uh, last, was it last summer? Yeah, I think last summer. And still could not find a lick of Poe on the property to this day. And the course is now 30 years old. Wow. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very unique property. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a bubble. It's, it's a great place to learn. And the owner there, it was top down there. The owner there, John McConnell, that also uh, started Worthington Steel and owns the Columbus Blue Jackets NHL team, uh, was very focused on you know, people developing that. And that's Todd was very much that way. And that's where leading into what you're asking scheduling wise, that's where a lot of it came from. You know, okay. Double Eagles, a top 100 facility, a top 10 in the country uh, condition course. And the, the premise from that schedule came from there, that level of property. And we worked a five on two off schedule. So half of the team worked Tuesday through Saturday. Um, and half the team works Sunday through Thursday. So everyone on the team had two days off every week, whether it be Friday, Saturday or Sunday, Monday. It's huge. <laughs> um, and it was, I mean, granted, we worked 12 hour days, sure. 10 to 12 hour days there because we were pushing. Um, but um, if we wanted more overtime, it was available. We could work one of our uh, days off. That was no problem. Now, special events, member guests, things like that, that everyone was on full tilt. Um, but that was, um, we had been discussing it, doing it here. Um, we were doing the traditional 12 on two off and I was, I was just growing frustrated and it was creating a lot more challenges for our assistants to, um, accomplish daily goals and really push our conditioning initiatives. So when, when COVID hit, we, we just said basically the hell with this, we're ripping the bandaid off. We're getting after it. We're, we're going to do this. It's going to be hard. It's going to be, but we have to layer this out because a lot of it was employee safety driven. Sure. Well, those first several months in COVID and, and still to this day, we're obviously, we're going to continue learning. It's a virus. It evolves, but we're the, the fear of the unknown. A lot of things were unknown for us. So uh, employee safety was paramount. So we layered in that type of schedule. And, and then did it again last year. Uh, and we've seen a dramatic reduction in absenteeism 
uh, dramatic reduction in um, um, tardiness, um, as well as a dramatic reduction in overtime. So, so obviously generational differences, you know, we're not seeing as many individuals that want to work 60, 70 hours a week. That's okay. Sure. So we, um, so it, it, we overcome that with just brute horsepower. So we, um, um, we go through that and continue to push and do that. So now our crew sizes continue to grow and, and layer in things like that. So that's how we've done the scheduling. Uh, and we're going to continue on that train. It has been a very, very good success for us. Uh, and we're going to continue with that. So have you, ha- I mean, so turnover is always, you know, going to be that, that elephant in the room. Have you mm-hmm. seen a reduction in that or were you not really having to battle that too badly before COVID anyway? Do you have a longer tenured crew that just had to adjust or, or is it kind of gradually become new, new players in the game as well? Um, it's a continued evolution for us. Um, the amount of new hires coming in, I would say is, is reducing. Um, from what, um, from what we used to see previously, um, just one, I think it comes down to quality of life is we, we, and a lot of it, I think the schedule helps, but I think at least, and again, this is just our situation. What has worked for us, what we believe in, what meshes with operational goals, standards of operation and what, uh, what we look at as a club. You know, we are a platinum club of America, so our our conditions have to match that and exceed that. But how do we we looked at it as a challenge? How do we match those or exceed those on a daily basis, but also work to live and not live to work? Well, uh, which was a it was more or less a challenge uh, thrown down from our our. Um, board president and greens chair when I first started is they said, look, we want you to be here. We want you to, to see your kids grow up. We want, we want you to do this. So dig in and get after it, figure it out. Sure. So in that we've taken that as a core. So we look at, okay, when we hire team members, uh, we look at um, more psychological questioning, sociological questioning that look, we want them, I I really don't care if they have experience in this, really doesn't bother me. But what we want is someone that thinks of we before me, most important person in the room is the person standing next to them. That's priority one for us. If that's not the case, I am sorry, you're not going to be a fit with us. But that's, that's what we look for. And we build off of that. And we look at it as an upside down triangle here. Like I'm here, my role is to support the assistants in managing leading operational goals on a daily basis and any needs or anything that the staff sees. Like, hey, if we, um, if we have X piece of tools or equipment, we're going to be able to be more efficient here. Assistants talk about it, bring it to me. We discuss it. Okay, let's figure it out. So that's, that's been a big um, the culture, I, I think, drives everything personally for, for our sure. operation. And sure. it works. Yeah. It works for us. Um, now, we continue to evolve it. Uh, we're layering in more and more 20-hour, uh, 25-hour a week employees uh, that just want to work mornings. Um, 6 to 11, fine. 6 to 11, grab lunch here at the club. Great. You know, beyond appreciated. They're into work on time. They take care of their equipment. And they move on. They they they're out for the afternoons when the course is full. So that that works for us. Yes. Uh, we're we're able to have more brute manpower in the mornings to really accomplish things. Sure, which is you know invaluable. You know, I don't know exactly what kind of play you're dealing with, but the, the idea is to get ahead of everybody and get your get your things done. So if you yeah, can mind blowing concept there. there. Yeah, getting ahead mind of blowing <laughs> mind blowing concept. Sure. Yeah. Speaking of that, just like everyone else, like when I, I came on board here in 2014, our play volume uh, was 14,000 rounds okay. uh, when I came here. And last year we hit 24,000. Wow. So just like everyone else, we're, sure. we're seeing the same crunches um, and the different discussions, good, 
good challenges, I guess I would say, at the golf committee level, the board level, of membership numbers, um, getting creative, getting getting members to enjoy their property. So. Sure. Yeah. So like, like I said, you've, you've had really good track record or, or bad luck, whatever you want to say it with assistants moving on into their own roles. And, um, and just recently you, you had a job posting and I think a lot of people saw it and I think it was eye opening and it, it echoes what you're saying about culture, work-life balance. And I think the industry has to go a little bit further towards that. Uh, you were able to fill that position. Is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, actually, uh, this coming Monday, we have, uh, uh, a young gentleman uh, by the name of Jared Weirich. Uh, he will be coming on board with us from just across town here in, in Orchard Lake Country Club. We're, okay. we're excited to have him on board. Very good. So, yeah, it's uh, I, I appreciate uh, the sentiments, Chad. It's a lot of it. I guess I would say it, it stems top down from our general manager. Uh, Craig, uh, obviously, was general manager here when I when I hired on. Um, uh, he has an athletic club background. Uh, so he came from Detroit athletic club, which, um, for those of you that don't aren't into athletic clubs, which I was not in the least bit, knew nothing about any of them. Um, and I've been fortunate to spend a little time down there now and kind of learn some of the history and things like that of athletic clubs around the country, the Detroit athletic athletic club is basically it's it's like the augusta national of athletic clubs it's it's an incredible building incredible facility mind-blowing history it's 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 truly an icon so his club management background and prowess with that was it was very very big um and a lot of why they were so successful there and continue to be successful was employee culture. And Craig is very big on that. And Craig is um, a, a big driving force with, um, look, we, we are a family here. We spend almost as much time here as we do with our family. So, you know, we need to provide our employees with the resources to enjoy coming to work and, and take that a step further and not looking at it as work sure. is, you know, we're providing a service, which uh, to me, providing a service is uh, the highest calling. It's, it's the hardest thing for a lot of people to do. And, but the, the rewards for appreciation from people uh, is pretty, pretty powerful. So we layer those things into um, our operation here. Uh, again, like I was very fortunate with Todd, uh, Todd has, uh, groomed and, uh, had a number of individuals move on to head superintendent roles from double Eagle, uh, Brad, when I was with the Trump organization, uh, just when I was there now, uh, of the gentlemen I worked with, there's, uh, in a matter of a year, there were three of us, uh, they were out in head superintendent roles. And now there's, um, in 10 years, I think Brad has had six. Uh, six individuals go out into head superintendent roles at, at several at very prominent clubs around the country as well. Uh, so, but it was a very much a collaborative process of letting, letting intern, or excuse me, assistants really grow, um, giving them a lot of responsibility. I, 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 uh, Kevin that you just mentioned uh, moved on. Uh, Kevin is over at, in at St. John's doing a full course reconstruction. Um, I was over there actually on Monday and, uh, he's got his hands full. Sure. It is a big, uh, basically throwing a stick of dynamite on the place and starting over. Um, uh, it's a big project. Um, and then, uh, Tim Maddie, the previous year, who's now in charge of all golf course operations at treetop resorts, um, you know, big 81 hole operation. So the thing we, we really is like, look, push is look. I'm here to support you, but at the same time, I'm going to push you Sure. and anything and everything from financials to agronomics, but more than anything is going back to a core principle. I, I will never forget in college is we had Joe Deutsch, who I know Joel will just salivate <laughs> talking about here. <laughs> um, God rest Joe's soul. Um, Joe came into one of our classes at Penn state and I'll never forget. You know, this simple premise, he, he drew a pie chart on the board and a 10% sliver. And he says, that's what you're getting here. 
The rest of that 90% is up to you and developing people and communication skills. That's it. And, and that's it. And it's, it's essence, you know, we absolutely is really delving into the, the human factor and what sure. we, what we've really stressed in our board, we're very fortunate. We have very, very good leadership here at the board level and the board gets it. And uh, it's top down in regards to that is a very cohesive mentality that we purchase products, we purchase equipment, um, things like that. We invest in people. Sure. And how do we continue to sharpen the knife and help help uh, people grow in their careers? Uh, I like I said, my two mentors. I was very very fortunate to have them in my career. Uh, I look at it as a challenge and an opportunity, whether it's assistants or our interns every year. Um, how do we continue to help foster them and their career goals? Sure. So just that kind of open-minded mentality, um, every winter uh, assistance, I give them blank slate with uh, labor budget and operations budget, and they have to develop out. I give them a full, full budget number and just using our property since we know our metrics. Okay develop out a budget and they've got to defend it to me, sure. um, things like that. And I'll give them different budget variations to do that. Uh, same with capital budgets. Okay. Develop out based on X amount, develop out a 10 year plan. How are you going to do this to get financial building blocks, uh, things like that. So there's, there's a lot of layers to it, but a lot of it is the core of everything to me. It comes down to one thing. I, I Chad, you and I talk about this all the time, but I'm a big one on getting to the why. Sure. It is we want assistance to get comfortable being uncomfortable. So, <laughs> um, you know, they uh, assistants do greens committee presentations, you know, not not because I don't want to do them. Sure. It's not that in the least bit, um, but they alternate each month. They give greens committee presentations, the, the whole thing. They're asking questions. Now I'm there with them. Like, so if a member asks a, a pointed question, you know, I can handle it. That's sure. fine. But more so they get comfortable in that role. And, you know, you're, you're working with very, very intelligent um, uh, men and women in a number of facets of life that um, they're going to be asking you candid questions. And a lot of times they're, the question they're asking is really not the true question. The question sure. is within that, what they're leading to. So being able to understand reading the room, politics, things like that is, is very key um, and that we work hard to help individuals with. Yeah, I think, I mean, I mean, that's fantastic. I think a lot of individuals probably enter into their first head position and, and that may be their weak link. You know, they've got all the grass and agronomy knowledge that they need. You know, they can run the operation, good people manager. But then now managing up to, like you said, those those ladies and and men that are doing, you know, some of the world's work, if you will. You know, some of these members are certainly uh, pretty high up there in the world stance. So um, I think that's awesome. And, and I think you're right. You know, getting comfortable being uncomfortable is is going to be important. And uh, I think it shows like you'd mentioned Tim Maddy. You know, I mean, he he went up there in one year and, and really, really put his put his stamp on it. Uh, and treetops, I think, is better for it. Yeah. Yeah. And Tim and Kevin, the, the, um, <laughs> they were a great balancing act for, for me because they, Tim and Kevin are the picture of patience. Um, you know, Tim is a very, very, um, intuitive with turf and agronomics, but, uh, does a very good job of listening. He doesn't just hear things. He listens very, very. And I, I think that distinction is, is very key. Uh, I mean, Kevin does it as well. And Kevin it, it takes it a step further that um, to me, and I, I, I say this um, because it's partially his personality, um, is I, I, I always thought of him like Tony Dungy. Um, not only is Kevin's personality very uh, similar, very, very humble, humble servitude, and just uh, a picture of class. But also is, is Kevin listens so thoroughly and so well. Uh, they both did that extremely well. But Kevin, Kevin's personality really meshes who I personally, I, I've always admired Tony Dungy. 
my father was a high school or uh, played high school, college football, coached high school football for years. So uh, he looked up to Tony Dungy immensely. So that was, uh, I, I saw some parallels there um, with Kevin with that. Sure. And they meshed well together because of that. Yes. Also. Yes. Yes. That, that was very key there. Each other's strengths. So Kevin's strengths were, were areas Tim needed to grow and Tim's strengths were areas where Kevin needed to grow. Then they fed off of each other very well. Sure. And one of the big keys, like with both of them, as well as now uh, Jack Tomasma, mm -hmm. our, our other system we have here now, and Jarrett coming on board, my core things with them is like, look, I don't want you leaving here thinking and doing things the way we do it here. I want you to, you're going to want to do things differently when, wherever you go. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. As much as I look up to Todd and Brad, uh, um, do things vastly, vastly different than how they do. Sure. And the appreciation for how he, each other does things in this business is one of the coolest things. It really sure. is to me. Yeah. No, there's a thousand ways to skin a cat, right? And, you know, not, not in a negative sense, but some of what an assistant is to do under you is learn how maybe they would do it differently. You know, you don't Correct. want that to be mistake driven necessarily, but I think there's a, there has to be a lot of truth to that because everybody's going to want to approach it a little bit differently. And if you can get to the end goal, then all should be satisfied. Correct. Yeah. So, no, I, I think that's, I, I, I think I wish, and I, I know a lot of superintendents do a phenomenal job with, with kind of mentoring and things, but um, I think it would be nice if, if some more got involved in those board meetings, like you said, and, and working with the budgets, I think they would just be a little bit better prepared moving forward. And, you know, you know, as well as anybody, it's, it's a, there seems to be a lot of entry level type assistant roles open sometimes, but you get into that next step is, is still not an easy thing. And, and it takes a lot of years and a lot of interviews usually. So, um, Excuse me. yeah. And there's, there's some things that we, I feel like we, you know, I, you know, and following up with Kevin and Tim afterwards, did I see like, Hey, we need to sharpen our pencils on here a little bit more to continue to evolve how we're uh, sure. helping aiding assistants moving on. Sure. Um, you, you'd mentioned the listening thing, and that's something I've tried to learn the last few years with my role in Earthworks. But you know, Nick Saban, I saw a video just the other day that said, you know, we've got we've got two ears and one mouth for a reason. <laughs> we should be listening twice as much as we're as we're saying anything. And you know, you hear it all the time. You can't, you're not going to learn anything that comes out of your voice. You already know it. You know, comes out of your mouth. You already know it. So um, another invaluable thing. Um, how about on, on the club level? Um, you'd mentioned the 24,000 rounds. What type of golfer are you catering to? Is it a little bit of everything? What is your focus playing condition wise? What do the members expect? What do you, what is your goal? Um, just outside of obviously being immaculate and things of that nature, which you are, but you know, do they, they, they like it firm and fast, you know, what, what's the goal for the club and the golf out there and how um, do you achieve that's, that? That's an interesting point. Um, so it's evolved. Well, let me start with that. So when I first started, I was like, you know, what? we're ripping the bandaid off. We're drying this place out. We're, we're going hard and fast and purple brown turf and everything. <laughs> and I, 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 there were several conversations my first year. I thought some heads were going to explode um, because they were, they, there was a mentality with um, some of the membership that they, they wanted everything green and plush. And that was priority. Um, and I wanted to evolve away from that uh, operationally. And that's through the, uh, the interview process here. That was the, the driving force. So uh, we evolved it to, okay, we, we won. There's a balance here, um, especially as rounds started up. Like we couldn't push things as firm and fast as we'd like. Like I'd, I would be thrilled to brown this place out. That would make me so happy and just really, really push hard, hard on the firm and fast, but we, um, we, we balance it. Uh, we run a deep and infrequent water program here. We're fortunate, probably the biggest thing, I, I guess I would back up here a second for conditioning wise, we're fortunate. The, the vast majority of our property, it's a natural 70, 30 sand loam. I mean, really rich soil, but fairly well drained for a very flat property. Uh, so we're very fortunate in that regard. Uh, but we, we push um, 
push things. Uh, members are okay with seeing some purple here and there now. They're they're okay with that. They get it. Um, and we continue to do that um, with uh, kind of the science aspect. I, I like to say, I, I know you always laugh at me with this. I, I like to throw the Darwinism. So when we see some POA checking out or the big thing that we're battling is POA Triv in our fairways is um, really pushing those uh, those spots out is when those brown spots show up. We do a lot of preemptive communication with it, but uh, educating members is like, look, that's that's what we want. You know, that stuff's checking out good. That's Darwinism. That bent grass is going to overtake that and we're going to be strong for it. And it's an evolution. OK, uh, with uh, how much we water. And that was another big thing of looking at historical water records. We we had to figure out some things as much as, as well as our incoming water to the property is a big, big challenge for us. Uh, but we we've reduced our water consumption in the last eight years uh, over 34 percent over the previous 20 year average. So and we're, we're continuing to. Um, obviously years like last year, those, those help those averages greatly, <laughs> uh, but, but still we're, we're continuing to work to fine tune things and we're working as well with our irrigation designer on a new irrigation system. Hopefully that will be coming in sooner than later, uh, to continue to fine tune that, uh, that it's conditioning driven that we can continue to firm surfaces and with a top dressing program. Uh, on our fairways, uh, as well as all our other surfaces here to continue to push uh, firm and fast surfaces so we can do firm uh, while still green. Sure. Um, uh, we can continue to push those further and further along. Uh, sure. A number of our members have seen a vast difference, but we see an opportunity just to, like we always do, anyone in our business, we're always, we're always looking in how to sharpen that knife and we can sure. continue to do that. Yeah. Was there a big adjustment as you brought in the the, the senior am playing condition wise or, or kind of just because what you're talking about, you you had a you had a head start, if you will. Yeah, uh, we had a head start. We had we had started a fairway top dressing program and kind of our water management strategies from back in 2014. So we had evolved the course um, mm -hmm. that so we knew we would be prepared with that. Um, some of the challenges we did face coming up to it were the normal challenge areas for everyone, pinch points for cart traffic. So we do probably about 60% of our rounds are walking, 40% uh, are probably carts. Uh, but the normal pinch points of approach areas where carts roll off sure, uh, and uh, also around fairway bunkers where whether it's members or our staff, we're like lemmings. We're going to it's yeah. like a horse track. <laughs> so the, the normal mitigating traffic in those areas that we saw that, but more so last summer was uh, we got six and a half inches of rain on June 24th. Uh, our, our pump house, our, our pumps, our, our 483 phase circuit breaker panel, everything was submerged under eight feet of water uh, uh, a little over two months out before the championship began um as well as massive massive amounts of flooding which everyone in southeastern michigan saw we were not um the lone ranger with that uh but we have the unique challenge where our drainage grid on the course so our greens are usga uh recommended uh construction bunkers are new with drainage tees are standard um eight inch sand compost mix with uh trunk line drainage and fairways uh, more or less have um, uh, every 20 foot running the length of the fairway, uh, every 20 feet, uh, there's four inch perf drain tile running the length of every fairway. So very good drainage system in there. But where all that drainage system goes to, it ties in with the city infrastructure that we're surrounded by. City sewer systems are not separated here. They are combined sewers with sanitary and water so all that rain our water had nowhere to go for two sure. days um and then we subsequently after that we had 14 inches of rain over 17 over the next 17 days after that so we were getting hammered with rain and we we experienced some turf loss uh especially in the roughs where we do not have very much drainage so 
Uh, there were some challenges there leading up to the championship. Uh, I, I will say throwing down 40 pallets of turf type tall fescue sod uh, the third week of July is never fun. No, <laughs> uh, never ideal. Uh, but the big thing leading in was um, uh, USGA and it was, it was really fun working with them in this is they, they wanted, they wanted that rough, rough. So okay. our, uh, our rough started at about six inches. Wow. It was, and we, we juiced it. Uh, we had, um, about three times the amount of normal nitrogen on it. So along with all that rain, humidity, just yeah. microbes going absolutely crazy. It was, uh, it was interesting getting it back down to height throughout. September. I imagine it was, <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine that's true. Um, Switching gears a little bit um, back to kind of the professional side of things. You're also involved in, in our association here in the state of Michigan, the Michigan Golf Course Superintendents Association. Um, tell us maybe a little bit about what's going on there, but mainly what, what's the value for you, for your club, and what do you bring to the organization? Um, you know, obviously, I work with several of you that are on the board, and it makes sense to me as I see you uh all but just maybe a little bit of the inner workings and and how that came to be and what what brought your interest into helping the, that out yeah um it is I, I it's my first year uh on the board uh this past year it's 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 really been interesting um obviously you well know like our executive director adam ickness is he's Top phenomenal much. yeah phenomenal just and, and even more so being a very good visionary for for the role um and all the um responsibilities he has which are very very wide reaching but he's the thing i enjoy about adam even more so outside of that is he's he's a good man he's a humble man sure um that makes it and and we're fortunate on the board it's the same thing like uh doug ware uh that just rolled off as board president um, I, I really enjoy conversations with Doug, um, uh, because he's, you know, we're at a private club, a massive membership, and he's in a municipality with three courses sure. with completely different resource platforms and seeing what he does and how he works through things, how he thinks through things. There's things that we bring back here and we're looking at, Hey, we really learn some stuff. Sure. So the thing I really enjoy about Michigan Superintendent Association is it's it's a very good collective of superintendents from all walks of clubs, and no one is uh, uh, off putting to anyone else. Sure, we're all in this together. We're all in. Hey, um, how can we help X person out? How can we help Y person out? To because we're all here to serve our fellow constituents, members, whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's a very uh, tight knit group that um, in a very uh, large that you see more than anyone variation from say Southeastern Detroit, um, more um, urban, um, you know, big clubs, things like that to Northern Michigan, where you've got clubs that are open for four months out of the year. Yep. <laughs> so their operation and vast differences, but we can learn a lot from each other. And that's, that's one of the key principles sure. that in helping each other. So, um, you know, we just finished up our, our, our spring meeting, annual meeting, um, uh, up at Boyne mountain yesterday. Mm -hmm. Uh, so that was, it was very good, very successful. Look forward to seeing the survey results from that. Uh, but some of the things we're working towards, um, uh, Jared Milner over at Meadowbrook is working, uh, leading this, but with um, kind of a uh, an arm of reaching out and a reach out source for superintendents that are going through challenges, not not just turf, but life challenges. How how can we how can we look to help people? And so Jared, um, Adam Gar with Syngenta is also uh, working through that. They're they're working through those uh, options, and that's what that's one of our big things. We've you know, we've seen numerous people across the country, uh, different challenges. Um, God rest his soul, the, the superintendent out at Patriot Golf Club in Oklahoma uh, last week uh, tragically passing. But like um, 
more so here in Michigan is like we've had two superintendents in the past couple of years pass away uh, from suicide that whatever it may be, we, you know, we don't know the, who, what, when, or why, sure. but um, how can we help be a resource? If we, if we can help one person, then, then we're going to do that. We're going to see right. what we can do. Yeah. So Doug, Doug was on board with that as president, the board as a whole is, um, and Ryan Moore now as president is, is very much. And we're, we're working collaboratively. I guess that's the biggest thing is everything we're looking at is continuing to, how do we continue to improve um, the experience for uh, all Michigan superintendent members? And it's a fun journey. It's a fun, a yeah. uh, lot to your point, listening. As a lot of it this past year was listening, seeing how, seeing how the board works, but more so how do we continue to build and grow what we offer members? So, And we're a large association you know, for, yes. for, for, a, for a state chapter, uh, quite large. And to your point, not just about how, you know, the club cultures and, and how long they may be open throughout our state, but I mean, superintendents and, and, you know, in the upper peninsula in Northern Michigan, I mean, it's just a completely different mindset, you know, they're from, from who they are to how they operate as a superintendent. So that's a, certainly a challenge for you guys, but it, it sounds like the board's up to the challenge. Yeah. And it's, um, it's, it's a unique challenge. It's, it's, uh, I, I love the diversity of it. I think it's so unique. And like, one of the things that a lot of people don't know is like Michigan has the third most golf courses in the country. Sure. We're behind Florida and Arizona in number of number of properties. Um, but also, um, anytime, any kind of economic, like say a recession, things like that, Michigan, similar to Florida, this mindset and Arizona is that, our economies are based on tourism and manufacturing. Yep. So we are always going to be the first ones into a recession and we're going to be the last ones to come out. Yeah. So we have to be very cognizant of that. And, and we're, we're very aware of that from, from a chapter standpoint and how do we continue to support our members uh, to help clubs get the resources they need, whatever budget range. They're at. Sure. Sure. Um, no, I think, again, you know, I think you're doing a great job with, with the board there. Uh, and, and I look forward to seeing how everything pans out in the next few years. Cause I, I enjoy being part of the association and I, I do like its size. You know, I travel throughout the Midwest and, um, we get pretty darn good attendance at the spring meeting like that and, and other events. So hats off to you guys. Yeah. Um, as everybody always says, we try to keep this at about an hour and we are coming up on it which does go pretty quick, but a couple of, I'm going to take a book or a page out of Kevin Hicks's book and do a lightning round, if you will. And uh, I know that you're, you know, I heard you talking about it a little earlier and in, in just previous conversations, you're kind of an architecture junkie, if you will, golf architecture. Um, do you have a favorite favorites? Why and which courses from those architects would those be? Hmm. Maybe I should have let him let you know this one's coming. <laughs> no, no, I love, I love it. I like yeah, throw me a curveball. I, I love it. Um, I, I'm a big Seth Rayner junkie. Okay. Big Seth Rayner junkie. Um, Camargo Club is just absolutely mind blowing to me. Sure. Uh, I, I, uh, the job Doug Norwell does down there, that property is, is so incredible. And actually, Ryan Slonick that we work with from Renaissance Design works with them as well. And They're gonna, they've got some work coming up, I think. Yes, they do. Yeah. And Brian, I, I remember he was laughing so hard the first time I was there, played it. And I called him driving back from Cincinnati. And I was just like a, a, a kid that just literally sucked down a bag of sugar. Like I was <laughs> bouncing off the walls and he's he's just like, I knew you would love that. Now it's just but Camargo, um, and then Yeaman's Hall. Yeaman's Hall is tough, I, tough to beat. <laughs> uh, I, I've not had the good fortune of being there yet. My wife, uh, my wife and I uh, uh, had a trip planned in October uh, for our anniversary. She was not happy with me. I got COVID right before it, so yeah. we had to postpone that. But I, I'm looking forward to getting down to there and um, uh, Country Club of Charleston. So, well, I was going to say that's you, you got a few good options down there uh, uh, in a pretty good spot to hang out. <laughs> yes. Um, all right. So 
Seth Rainier, you're going to leave it there. How about a modern day? You got a modern day architect that you you tend to to gravitate towards? Man, uh, I mean, I think there's so many good ones. Sure, so many from where like you worked with Corin Crenshaw. Um, I I love working thoughts. Absolutely. Sure. Like the patients and the working with Brian Slonick. Uh, we worked with Brian Schneider here. Uh, sure. he, he did our short game area. I mean, the project he's got going on at old Barnwell, yeah. man, I can't wait to see that come to fruition. Sure. Uh, Kai Goldie, Tyler Ray. Um, and a lot of these that are just really coming, starting to pop out. Um, Blake sure. Conant that obviously oh, yeah. you worked with as well. Yep. Um, but I, I would have to just stick in my backyard, stick to my knitting here in Michigan. I, I got to go to the Renaissance boys. Hey, I you think know, that and there's nothing wrong with any of that either. <laughs> they're, they're, they're the gold standard to me because, you know, I, I love working with them. And that's no knock on any other architect at all. No, absolutely. Like you said, there's, there's tons of great ones out there. You got to have a preference and, uh, from somewhere. So how about... Uh, Dream foursome and where are you going to tee it up? Whew. Um, dream foursome. Uh, yeah, that's that's a good one. Uh, my wife, um, who is a heck of a player, if, 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 if I can say right, she's yes, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so my wife, uh, had the good fortune, she played collegiately at the University of Texas, she's four year, uh, uh, Letterman there, all Big 12. Um, she played out on the Symmetra Tour uh, for several years, played in a few LPGA events. So uh, getting my rear end kicked on the golf course, I'm kind of <laughs> used to that. <laughs> I bet. Um, but my wife, um, my father, um, just because, I mean, I look up to him a lot. And the person that got me into the game, my grandmother. Okay. Um, that would uh because she she was oh my god she was terrible terrible golfer but, <laughs> uh, but she loved the game she loved competition and she loved laughing and having a good time and that's 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 um, what makes a good golfing partner right there <laughs> exactly so and and we and she was always the uh, if you play well, play fast. If you play bad, play faster. Obviously, that's <laughs> I love a it. <laughs> mantra, but she pushed that. Sure. She pushed that, and I, I, I abide by that, and I love that. That would be my dream for some. Where, where are you going to play? Um, going to go back to the old family stomping grounds in Northwest Ohio? <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I would say that would be fun. Like uh, my father and my wife and I have done that several okay. times um yeah i'd probably just say that I, I would probably just say that you know i i could have like the actually no you know i i take that back what i would say is i, I would say um just because to me it's one of the most legendary and incredible properties um that we're fortunate to have here in the states and i mean you worked close to is pinehurst too play a championship iconic course with the layers of history with people that I know that would appreciate it for sure. Yeah. That's, that would be truly incredible to me. No, I I'd say you hit the nail pretty good there. Um, yeah. Yeah. So like I said, Ross, we're kind of coming up against the time we try to, so the listeners can stay engaged. We're going to try to keep it about an hour, but uh, I, I really do appreciate your friendship support, taking the time out to, to chat with us a little bit today. Um, and thank you to all the listeners out there. Please remember to subscribe if you haven't already and check out our, our podcast and two minute turf talks on YouTube. Um, and until next time, thank you. Thank you.